and welcome everyone to the main event, Mark's podcast, now on the Unhinged Sports Network. I'm lifelong wrestling fan and former radio guy, Troy, and with me as always is the WWE Walking Wrestling Encyclopedia, the main event collector, and the Owen Hart to my Jeff Jarrett, he's Greg. What's up, Greg? What's up? I gave you the better one this week. (laughs) I guess I could have went with Triple H and X-Pac, that would (laughs) have... I have the size difference, and you're a big Triple H mark, so... But I figured I'd give Jarrett some love for once, because we always usually trash on him, or at least I do. I don't uh, have a problem with him, necessarily. Nah, I don't think he's horrible. i just never been a huge fan. But, yeah, before we get into the subject at hand, I just want to let everybody know that uh, we here at the Main Event Marks are sponsored by Fubo TV and Fanatics. If you're a sports fan, you're going to want to click on the links down in the description and let them know main event marks and unhinged sports network sent you and today we are talking about saint valentine's day massacre did you watch this one live yeah of course well yeah you were a big wwe guy back in the day and yeah i'm not see, now. I, well you know what i mean <laughs> but uh you will always order the pay-per-views i think honestly the first pay-per-view i ever ordered and watched live was wrestlemania 20 so anything before that, I had to watch, you know, um, throw it in your Google machine, but I had to watch it VHS. You and I usually talk about that on here. VHS? Uh, the hell's that? <laughs> this was actually my first viewing of this, start to finish. I think I've seen the cage match before, uh, but that was the only one I've ever seen on this entire card throughout. So this was a look back for you and a first time viewing for me. So... That's where we're coming at it from here. I love to watch. <laughs> That's going to be your new shirt. You've, <laughs> you've dropped that line a handful of times now. We just need to make that a shirt for you. And you, your birthday's you can, coming, so... You can mistake it as dirty, and you can... It, nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I like to watch wrestling. I mean, it's just how you interpret it. It's yeah, well, like, like I said, thing. It's, a, it's a shirt. But all right, yeah, we're going to... Uh, jump into the show here in a few but right now before we get into all that we have a lot of news and notes from february of 1999 to jump into so we're gonna gonna take a quick break and when we come back just put yourself mentally into february of 1999 in the wrestling world you know stuff's going on man we'll be back after this Follow the Main Event Marks at Facebook.com forward slash Main Event Marks Pod, on Twitter at Main Event underscore Marks, and on Instagram at Main Event underscore Marks, and at Main Event Collector. The Main Event Marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back, but before we get into the news and notes... Make sure that you visit unhingedsn.com to hear us every Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We come on the air right when NXT and AEW Dynamite launch on television. That's 5 Pacific, right? Yeah. I never got those time zone things. Yeah, for those of you in Narnia time, we are at uh, 5 o'clock. Or, you know, 7 o'clock Central, and people in Mountain Time can go F themselves. But... (laughs) Wow. Oh, come on. I don't think I offended that many people. People. Maybe I did. I don't know. But anyway, getting into uh, everything that happened in 99, man, you know, we always got to start off with death. So buckle in. This is a big one, literally and figuratively. Giant Baba was taken to the hospital and confined to a bed. And then on uh, January 31st, 1999, Baba died of liver failure from complications of colon cancer in the Tokyo Medical University Hospital. He was 61 years old. The reaction in Japan has been huge with comparisons to the deaths of Elvis Presley and John Lennon here in America. Baba was considered a national hero in Japan. Every TV network and more than 200 other reporters camped outside of Baba's home during the private funeral service. That is large, man. I mean... Uh, we're quick to, you know, like the story mentioned at one point, they said, you know, we're quick here in America to say, compare it to like Hulk Hogan. But in all honesty, I mean, th- it is closer here with this to compare it, you know, to Elvis and John Lennon over in Japan. 
for those that don't know, Baba was like a founder, the, the founder of uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling, along with, uh, I guess, the sons of Ricky Dozan. So we try, I try to get these out of the way early, man. Staying on with uh, the, the depressing stuff. This one isn't death, but, uh, well, Tammy Sitch, which is always a great way to start off the story. <laughs> Wow. Uh, Tammy Sitch was like arrested. that horribly, but whatever. <laughs> well, she was arrested last week at her mother's house for violating a restraining order because she's not supposed to be on the property. When what does it say about your life when your mother has a restraining order on you? I know. Yeah, yeah you beat me to that. I was like, you know, in what kind of world is like, how bad off do you have to be where your own mother's like, I'm going to file a restraining order on your ass. Like, don't come near me. Well, we've seen her. She's pretty messed up. Yeah, and I'm not trying to make light of her problems because she clearly has many, but good grief. This just, it was all all the way back in the late 90s, man. It goes all the way up to today. I mean, it's been going on for over 20 years. She had a good thing going, too. That's the sad part. I know. Well, apparently she just, she was a very jealous person in the WWF, so... I, I guess, you know, she was one of them where it's like, why are you pushing Sable? I'm just as hot. And, you know, and that kind of led to it's like, yeah, you're hard to work with. Get the F out. <laughs> but I think Marlena got more than her. Yeah. Here we go, man. Uh, so, you know, keeping on with this isn't depressing as much as it is. Yeah, just like, I, what the I know. Hell? I, can, I can hear the chuckle in your voice. I know it's not depressing. So hit me with it. <laughs> well, it's just like effed up uh, at an ECW house show. <laughs> Which is again is always a great way to start it. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I only have to Rob, hear it. But yeah, Rob Van Dam did his big dive from the ring into the crowd. You know that front flip he always used to do. But he all but he ended up taking out a fan who was knocked unconscious and was down on the ground for quite a while before being taken out in an ambulance. Oh my God, <sighs> I swear we did another story about this where. Fans were getting the crap knocked out of them in ECW, and then Paul Heyman comes out. It's like, please don't sue. <laughs> My dad's a, a lawyer. My dad's a very powerful Jewish lawyer in New York. He says this stuff. So here's another one. Public Enemy will be finishing up with ECW again next month at next month's pay-per-view. Word is that WWF is offering them a contract. There's also rumors that they're in negotiations to return to WCW. Spoiler, they go to WWF. Oh. <sighs> When is it that – wait, right? They didn't go back to WCW, did they? In 99? Did they? did they? I think they went straight to WWF, didn't they? Didn't they get the – just the dog crap beat out of them by the Acolytes this year? I, I want to say they were in WWE for a minute when the Dudleys debuted. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember they were – uh, They might not have been there. They might have just made a cameo. I feel like they faced the Dudleys in WWE, which was late 99. Okay. Well, it was 99 when the Acolytes just, it was either 99 or 2000, whatever, one of them, where the Acolytes just, you know, had that match on Heat with them where, um, yeah, we don't speak about that. But yeah, we don't speak about Heat. We don't talk about, you know, murder on nationwide TV. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, if you really have to see it to know what I'm talking about, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, just just Google it or YouTube it or something. <laughs> it's It's out there. Perry Saturn and Shane Douglas both had heart scares. In Saturn's case, he was having shortness of breath that kept getting worse at his hotel, and he tried to drive himself to the hospital. It got to the point where he almost couldn't breathe at all. He stopped at a toll booth and alerted the people there who called an ambulance and had him rushed to the hospital. Saturn has been wrestling with a back injury, compressed vertebrae, and discs, and whatnot, and believes that something related to that sent him to into a panic attack, which made his heart go nuts, thus the EKG readings. That poor guy, I, man. Yeah, he's had a lot of crap going on in his life. And uh, speaking of uh, lots of injuries towards the end of his career, in Shane Douglas's case, he was also in a car driving back from a show when he started suffering heart attack symptoms and went to the hospital. The week of this event that we're talking about today, he had yet to be released, and there was no word on if he actually had a heart attack or not, but he was in the hospital for about three days, so it's probably something semi-serious. We're talking I mean, about two guys who are not that old either. That's the sad part. I know. And I don't know what their history with substances were at this time. I never heard anything about Shane. I'm pretty sure Shane just smoked weed. Yeah. 
which is not going to give you a heart attack. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. With uh, Saturn, I don't know when his substance abuse started. I, I mean, I assume he was clean at this point because WWE was willing to snatch him up, and he was in WCW for quite a while. So, I don't know. I always found it funny, by the way, he hung out with a Raven who looks like he did a crap ton of drugs. Yeah, I know. I, I think Raven was just high on himself. I, yeah. I, I don't think he did anything. I said the same about CM Punk. I'm like, if I took one look at that dude, like, and I'm talking about like in his early WWE days, I would yeah. look at that dude. I'd be like, that guy's a huge drug abuser. <laughs> so, what the looks deceive you? Well, you remember what I said to you the other day about like, uh, I'm, I might lose some female listeners here, but I mean, women openly admit it's like, it takes them two hours to tell a 10 minute story. Well, Raven, if you ever listen to his podcast, he's kind of the same way. He's, he's, he's hilarious, but he's frustrating as hell to listen to because it's like, dude, get to the effing point. I've actually said that about Conan. <laughs> yeah, Conan does that at times too. But him, I can, I can excuse as he's ripping a bong in the, in the background with, with Raven. Like, I think he, I think he's been diagnosed with ADHD. So is he like freaking like legitimately brilliant though? Yes, he has an extremely high IQ, and he passed the bar. He could have been a lawyer, and he turned it down to be Raven. So, are we sure it was turned out to be Raven, and not turned out to be uh, Johnny Polo? Yeah, uh, that might have that that was probably it. Let's go with down, mine because mine's more funny. <laughs> yeah, he turned it down to be Johnny Polo and Johnny Flamingo, <laughs> or Scotty uh, Flamingo. Excuse me. I, how dare I get that name wrong? Fun fact, TJ marked out so hard when he saw him at a table at the uh, WrestleCon. Who, Raven? Dude, it's Raven. Oh, yeah. I, you hella geek. <laughs> I've been a huge Raven fan for, like, years. <laughs> and you did not go get his autograph, but whatever. I, yeah, I can't remember why I passed it Because you spend it on demolition, like a loser. Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Screw me. I want to see <laughs> demolition. <laughs> yeah, in my defense, I think I only had enough money for one, and I was like, well, you yeah, have for a couple, but you earmarked some of it for Christian, so. That is true, yeah. Well, I wasn't gonna not get Christian's autograph. Come on, man. Yeah, but you skipped Raven for Christian. Loser. Yeah, screw me. Both of which, by the way, were former NWA champions. Just putting that out there. Lex Luger suffered a torn bicep in a house show match with Conan and is expected to be out for three months. Luger has been very vocal about blaming Conan for the injury. <sighs> Lex Luger, who you met at WrestleCon, by the way. I did. So I'm tying Whilst it all in. you were in line to meet Christian, and then I went and got in front of you and met him, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't remember this injury. Do you remember Luger being out? I, I don't time? remember the injury, but well, obviously it was a house show. But I do remember, I'm like, man, this new NWO thing just happened on the uh, Finger Poke of Doom. Which yeah. Is, you know, a great episode, obviously. And then he was just gone. I mean, he was there for a couple of weeks, and then he was just gone. So, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, and he like, blamed Conan. Is- I, I want to know, like, when you hear Conan faced Lex Luger in a match, one of them got injured and it was the other one's fault, you would tend to think, wow, Luger injured Conan. Yeah, right. But, ah, so, and I would, it, I obviously never saw the match. It was a house show, but, I mean, maybe it was Conan's fault. I'm not, you know, saying Luger's a liar. Yeah, but I've always subscribed to the theory that crap happens, dude. You know? I know. Yeah, I know some like, people are more like dangerous, or whatever, but it happens, dude. It's yeah, like, it, well, my point was like it's effing Conan. How many people has he injured by being careless? Like seriously, if you're gonna throw a fit, like yeah, you're probably upset, but you're, I mean, with his contract in WCW, it's like yeah, it sucks you're injured, but it's like oh poor you, you get to go sit at home in your mansion and collect you know your money while you don't work. Yeah, right. Speaking of WCW. Thunder was so bad that by the end of the show, fans were chanting Backlash, which is the name of the WWF pay-per-view that was held in the same arena in April. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> that's, uh, that's bad. Well, I said goddamn, G-O-T. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, who chants Backlash? <laughs> oh, that was a really good pay-per-view, I remember that, but who chants that? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think what would have even been on that Thunder card that it was so bad. Well, they were like, I Man. do remember at one point when Russo was on camera in WCW, he, he literally said, we're going to make Thunder fun again. And they turned it into another show that 
that had stuff on it. Because at this point, it was just like the other guys. Maybe a one match or two from guys who were on Nitro. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. If somebody can dig up which, because uh, this show here took place on February 14th. They're reporting on the thunder that happened the week before. So if anybody can figure out what, you know, what took place on that thunder that was so freaking bad, let me know. It's I'm probably just a buildup of a lot of stuff, but that'd be my yeah. guess. And, and what it, by the way, make thunder fun again? When was it fun to begin with? Well, there was some good stuff when it first started, to be fair. Yeah, I, I, mean, I just it remember. Was, it was watchable and stuff happened on there that you needed to see to watch Nitro. I, mean, I just remember as a kid, I wasn't a big WCW fan. I didn't keep up with it. But I remember I, I genuinely liked a few episodes of Nitro whenever I would tune in. But I would tune into Thunder here and there because I got bored and wanted something to watch. <laughs> I just never really watched an episode of and like I said, I you can't go off of me because I didn't keep up with it consistently, so I'm not the best judge. But I just remember as a kid, whenever I tuned in to Thunder, I was like, ah, this isn't as good as Nitro. That's saying something, by the way. Ish. This isn't as good as Nitro, which we all know is a hot show, especially 99. Hey, well, 99, yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, Keeping up a little bit with WCW here, Goldberg got a lot of media publicity for his appearance before Congress recently, where he spoke against dogfighting and cockfighting and about being an animal rights activist. He also appeared on Regis and Kathy Lee and uh, will also be on Jay Leno's show next week. To promote uh, Road Wild, where Jay Leno will be competing. But we don't know yeah. that yet. First of all, the most 90s things I've, I've said so far in this podcast were <laughs> Regis and Kathy Lee and the Jay Leno show. Second of all, go, when I label Goldberg, the words that come to mind aren't animal rights activist. <laughs> I mean, yeah, cool for him. Of, Maybe for a loop too, but yeah, I mean, cool for him. I mean, that's that's awesome. I don't know who the hell in their right mind would support dog fighting and cock fighting. I assume, uh, especially being a Georgia boy, he was not none too happy with Michael Vick back in the day. But yeah, this uh, just not what I when I hear Goldberg was before Congress, I wouldn't think, oh, he was speaking out against dog fighting. Like, <laughs> right. What? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's probably the best thing he could be in front of them about. But right. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I didn't know dogfight was a thing until Michael Vick. Yeah, I not like I kept up with it. But I mean, There is a, a funny episode. Of, we've referenced South Park a few times on the show. There's a funny episode of uh, uh, South Park where they had cockfighting. But instead of like the chickens fighting each other, they played Magic the Gathering. <laughs> and they trained Good the Lord. chickens to play it. And uh, <laughs> Cartman adopts a, a rooster and he calls it McNuggets. <laughs> I've seen that one. Oh, I've seen that part. <laughs> That's just just a fun little aside about that story. But anyway, uh, WCW is reportedly offering Chris Jericho a $750,000 per year deal to stay, but he hasn't accepted it yet. Again, spoiler, he won't. Oh, well, he might. <laughs> yeah. Well, is, is he going to sign? Well, and, and you know what happens, Greg? Uh, Eric Bischoff says, you sign the deal right now. And he said, well, I'm not going to sign it. And he's like, fine, no ticking, no laundry. You're losing the TV title to Conan. Yeah. Allegedly, that's how it all went down. <laughs> Still one of my favorite parts on the show, uh, on, on Conrad and Eric Bischoff's podcast, where, you know, uh, Eric says, well, I don't remember saying that, but, you know, I, I'm not saying I didn't say it. And then later on, I running, remember, yeah, I remember he flat out said, I don't remember saying that, but it sounds like something I would say. <laughs> Yeah. And then yeah. he's going through the results of what of uh, Jericho's matches. And then finally he loses it. He does lose it eventually to Conan and Bischoff just out of nowhere. He's like, I told him no taking no laundry. Hot damn. <laughs> I like when he says that, though, because he's like flat out mitts. I, I don't totally believe him. He's like, I don't yeah. remember saying that, but that sounds like something I would say. Yeah, it's like, it's like well, I that legitimately does... believe you don't remember saying that. I actually do. It's like, well, um, that doesn't come to mind, but that tracks. So <laughs> an AP news story getting into WWE now uh, about Kurt Angle ran in newspapers around the country this week, basically talking about Angle transitioning from Olympic amateur wrestler to pro wrestling and all the people criticizing him for it. Because, you know, all them real wrestlers, they look down upon that fake entertainment stuff. <laughs> Is it ironic that we transition from a Conrad podcast and to talk about Kurt Angle? Not now. 
Yeah. Well, I don't know. When was it that Kurt Angle debuted in WWE? <clears throat> uh, Survivor Series this year. Ah, okay. I know he spent some time in Memphis uh, wrestling there, and then he was trained technically by, I mean, he was trained by Dr. Tom Pritchard, but I guess he famously says, he's like, well, I didn't really train him. I just kind of told him how to do it, and there you go. So, because he said he was a freaking natural that had been doing it better than people way older than him, which I can totally believe. What was he a doctor of, by the way? Uh, well, according to our last week's episode, he was a doctor of disaster. So, <laughs> oh, but in reality, I think he was a doctor of desire. But then again, I could be wrong. That's according to Jim Cornette. Mother Was he a face uh, or a heel? A heel came out of a desirable box. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a story that'll punch you right out of left field. Bob Backlund announced that he will be running for Congress as a Republican in his home state of Connecticut in the 2000 election against incumbent Democrat Congressman John Larson. Spoiler, he didn't win. (laughs) Oh, man. And then he would be in the Royal Rumble the year after to promote it. (laughs) Yeah, he's in the... We just reviewed it, by the way, so let me just... (laughs) I know. He's in the 2000 uh, Royal Rumble, and then he runs for election in Connecticut. My gosh. I love Jim Cornette's line in that. Hey, Connecticut registered voters, we're looking for you. <laughs> yeah. Bob Backlund, man. Uh, allegedly, I guess the, the legend goes that uh, it was between him and Steve. I think it was him and Steve Kern uh, back in the 70s or whatever. It was one. I think I want to say it was Kern down in Florida. And they were whoever was the booker down in Florida kept trying to tell Vince. It was like, oh, you, you don't want Backlund. You want Kern. He's he'll be a star for you. And Vince was like, oh, I bet I can make Backlund a star. And he's like, you're full of crap. And he's like, I'll take your bet. And boom. And then Vince Jr. made Skinner. So they both won. Yeah. Well, I was talking about Vince Jr. But yeah, it's just. Wait, I don't uh, think he was in the 70s, though. He was helping run a little bit with his dad, like the, the late 70s. Pretty he sure wasn't. Senior is the one who put Bob Backlund in the limelight, though. Yeah, he might have. So maybe I maybe I am wrong there. It was one of the Vinces. But either way, one of them made uh, Bob Backlund a huge star, basically on a bet. And the other one made Skinner a star. So what's they all win? Shut up. <laughs> what, what, what part? What what tag team was Steve Kern a part of? Was it the Fabulous Ones? Was it the Fabulous Ones? I want to say it was Steve Kern and Stan Lane, but I could be wrong. Either way. It was either uh, Steve Curran or the original Doink. It's one of those two. Like, because it was a weird team. Oh, gosh. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, two right wing religious groups, the American Family Association and Morality in Media Incorporated. Oh, God. I know this is going. <laughs> have complained about the WWF's Super Bowl commercials, specifically the brief shot of two people who are shown making out in the background, and they sent numerous complaints to the FCC. One of the groups put on a press release saying, quote, a woman was clearly shown on an office desk on her back with her skirt wide open, legs spread high in the air towards the viewing audience. Deep between her legs was a man thrusting his groin wildly in simulated sex, end quote. (laughs) Wow. Before we comment on that, can we just take a a moment to just appreciate the absurdity of that wording? (laughs) I'm pretty sure that was My, not Val Venus doing it either, by the way. I think he was walking through the hall while they were doing it, so. Yeah. Uh, as, which would make story, sense, but. It, well, and the story says, which obviously is a bit of an exaggeration. The press release also said wrestling is, quote, neither a sport nor a form of entertainment fit for civilized people, end quote. Uh, civilized people. I mean, I don't think our podcast is fit for civilized people, but, I, you know. I don't know. We bleep out the swears and keep it Christian. So maybe we are. We don't simulate sex on the podcast. So hey, please speak for yourself, dude. Yeah. I, it's just like, you know, I get it. You know, the Attitude Era was obviously very racy and there was a lot of stuff I would have said, yeah, it's not uh, family friendly entertainment. You know, it might not even qualify as good. But this really off the TV. Yeah. This one, I guess, aired during the Super Bowl, but there is no way they were going to air a commercial during the Super Bowl of two people simulating sex. 
That might have been the one that didn't air. Yeah. Or it's two, just so. stupid. Ugh. Moving on, WWE here. Yeah, the kids, right? They know what sex is. Jeez. <laughs> You're going to have to learn about it sometime, little Timmy. The, who was in the uh, 99 Super Bowl? 99, 99. I think that's the Broncos and the Falcons. Okay. Well, I, hey, kids in Atlanta already know what the deal is. Kids in Denver, you're about to learn today. All right. <laughs> Uh, the reason The Rock has been wrestling with a shirt lately is because of his chest surgery to fix gynecomastia, I believe is how it's pronounced, or as Uncle Dave puts it, or bitch tit syndrome, as it's known in slang. Wow. Yeah. You know, I mean, if anybody somebody... knows about being the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it fits. You know, if, my gosh, it just really... Uncle Dave has to add in there some, you know, a little jab. It's like the guy's got legitimate, like a legitimate, like, uh, I don't know if it's technically a health concern. It kind of is, but it's like, he's got a body issue that needs surgery on. And you're going to say, well, he has bitch tit syndrome. And also he says, as it's known in slang, like, yeah, because if there's one person who's a walking urban dictionary, it's <laughs> Uncle Dave Meltzer. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, he thinks the Young Bucks are slang for wrestling, so maybe he is. Hey, don't bring the Young Bucks into this. Aren't they his biggest fans? Well, I mean, their finishing move is called the Meltzer Driver. So. I think it goes them and then Conrad in a close two-way tie. Wow. Well, speaking of uh, those two words that I just bleeped out, apparently there's a lot of heat in the WWF with Sable right now. Is that inappropriate to say? <laughs> Is, I ain't touching that. That was a bad segue, maybe. I don't know. But both Sable and Mark Marrow reportedly asked for their release from the new three-year contracts that they just signed a couple of months ago. But they were both turned down. WWF knows that they're going to get a lot of publicity out of the upcoming Sable Playboy issue, so they don't want her leaving right when it comes out. They have uh, also complained that Sable never trained to be a wrestler and didn't come to the WWF to be one, and that she doesn't want to wrestle at all. So I don't see the the bad there. We knew this. Right? Yeah, I guess they were Mero and well, Mero and Sable were complaining about that. I guess because they were like, well, she wasn't supposed to be a wrestler, and you guys just threw her in the ring. It's like, couldn't she just say no? Especially if you guys want out of your contract, just say, say no. no. <laughs> they were the ones that signed the contract to begin with, and it's like. It, you know, you and I both have that. It's like, you know, if you sign your name on the dotted line, you know, you, there you go. You know, you, you honor the contract. Sorry, you know, you don't like it. But what gets me is like they just signed a new deal like months ago. And then they come up and they're like, we want out. Well, probably should have thought about that before you signed a three-year contract, buddy. It's a lot of people's problems. They see the bottom line, literally. <laughs> yeah. And apparently uh, Mark Merrill pitched. He's like, well, if I'm going to have to stick around, just make me Johnny B. Bad again. And they were like, we can't. That's the whole reason you're currently Marvelous Mark Marrow. It's because we can't make you Johnny B. Bad. So that didn't go over well. Second part of the story here. Oh, I'm sure you remember this. I'm sure you've seen it. Sable, China, and Deborah were on a TSN show this week, and the conversation got heated with Sable and China shooting on each other and Sable accusing China of using steroids and trashing her for her plastic surgery. A lot of people in the WWF sided with China on this, feeling like Sable went way over the line. Yeah, I'm sure she's never had any plastic surgery done, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. And the whole thing, I, I don't remember word for word, but I just remember they asked China, it's like, well, why aren't you the women's champion? She said, well, I, I don't have any interest in wrestling the women. If I ever did, I'd win the belt in three seconds. And Sable was like, well, how can you say that? You've never faced me before. And she's like, well, I'm three times as big as you. He's like, well, what do you put in your body to make yourself three times as big as me? And just going on like that. And it's like, my gosh. And yeah, they both took jabs at each other about steroids, or uh, not steroids, uh, plastic surgery and whatnot. So, yeah. Bruce Pritchard said, yeah, the heat fell on Sable because nobody liked her in the back. But at the same time, he said, as far as the office went, heat was on both of them because neither one of them handled the situation properly. And they said Deborah was there. I don't remember Deborah being there, but if she was there, I can imagine her like 
just in the fetal position in the corner, just like trying as hard as she can to not be on camera. (laughs) She's like, I'm going to let this one explode and I'm not going to be anywhere near it. New girls in the corner, puke her guts out. (laughs) Hell. Uh, Road Dog is expected to check into rehab this week and will probably be out until WrestleMania. I don't remember when he returned. Was he at WrestleMania? Yeah, but that also now explains my question about this pay-per-view we're about to do. Uh, yeah, they excuse it as uh, he's injured, but in all honesty, and, you know, good for him, man. I mean, Road Dog is a legitimate tough guy. He's a former Marine. He's... You know, he re- he was in Desert Storm, and I guess he he himself came up to management, said, "Hey, I have a problem. Uh, I need to go to rehab," and they sent him. They didn't force him into it, so good on him. And he's currently employed with the rest of the click in the <laughs> in the back. And uh, you know, isn't he working on SmackDown? I think so, but he's done some NXT commercials too, so I don't know. Yeah. So I mean. It- He's he's doing great, and from what I, if you hear interviews about him from like people wrestling now, they say they love dealing with him in the back, and he's a very smart guy. He is the son of a uh, Bullet Bob, so the hell does that mean? Well, I don't know. Bullet Bob was a a good booker for years, from what I heard back in the territory days. So maybe uh maybe his dad passed on a little knowledge to him. You know, if you laid out at the beginning of their careers all the Armstrong boys, I never would have picked out. You know, Brian is like, you know what? He's going to do huge things. The rest of them, nothing. I probably would have said Brad. Yeah, everybody said Brad was amazing in the uh, very and great personality behind the camera. On camera, he was nothing, which is probably why he had a million and one different gimmicks in WCW. Remember Buzzkill? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's me. It's me. It's that B U double Z. I wonder what that was a parody of. I, uh, they I, came up, there was no parody at all. They came up with that themselves, dude. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. And the, and the whole tune of his theme song. Just, no, yeah, that uh, was all original. <laughs> I still don't understand with the gimmick and clearly what they were trying to do. Why did he come to the ring dressed like a hippie? Uh, buzzkill. Like, uh, that's what they say when, like, someone's bringing down their high or whatever. Yeah. Maybe a but but well, if, if the guess- whole... If the whole gimmick was a parody of Road Dog, basically, the hell. Yeah. And and this was obviously way beforehand. I, it was his legitimate I, initials, but I clearly don't have an answer. So <laughs> I did think it was funny that like you know his brother would team up with badass Billy Gunn, who were BA on everything, and then uh, you know him back in the day on his trunks would wear had BA on it. It's just like little ironic things that match up. Uh, but speaking of Road Dog. He had a scare last week at a house show. The top rope was loose, and it resulted in him taking an unplanned bump over the top, and he landed on his head. His right arm went totally numb. He got back in the ring, but The Undertaker uh, immediately pinned him, and then the show was held up for 15 minutes uh, while they put him in a cervical collar and took him out on a stretcher. Luckily, it was just a stinger, and he was released later that night. Man, bad times for Road Dog, man. Yeah, right? It's like, you know, you talk about when it rains, it pours. Poor but, dude. you know, he pulled out of it. You know, by the time he went to TNA, he was completely clean and sober and healthy and doing well. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view, last story here, uh, did a 1.88 buy rate, which would be the second biggest pay-per-view in WWF history behind WrestleMania 14. In that, the was same a, year, actually. that was a good one. Or, well, I'm sorry, not the not, uh, not same. Within a year. Set, yeah, within a year. Yeah, uh, this one, obviously, and we'll talk about it because, I mean, the, it was the play into this show here, but it was, you know, the no chance in hell, the uh, Royal Rumble. I remember it very well as a kid. I was very disappointed I didn't get to I didn't get to order it on pay-per-view. But as soon as it came out on VHS, I was right there to pick it up. That was just uh, VHS so, crap you keep talking about. Yeah, you throw it in your Google machine and check it out. For all you young punk kids out there that don't know what it is, I, I kind of envy them <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Because in, in 2021, you'll never hear the words, hey, you recorded over my show. That's true. Yeah, you won't. You deleted my show off the DVR. <laughs> <laughs> ah, crap. Wait, 
the uh, season finale is coming on. What do we want to record over? Our wedding <laughs> or uh, first birthday? Uh, little Timmy's first steps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever. He'll take more steps. Put it in. <laughs> And I remember the trick of, uh, you know, if you didn't want to tape record it over, you pulled off the little plastic tab on the front of the VHS. But if you were like, ah, crap, uh, you know, I didn't mean to do that. And some did break off by accident. You put a little piece of tape over it. So, yeah. So you got around it back in the day. Now you don't have to uh, jerry rig anything. <laughs> Good Lord, man. My <laughs> And my cousin posted a picture the other day of one of those uh, tape rewinding machines. You remember those? I do. Oh. Yeah. And yeah, he posted that. I posted a picture of that on Facebook. And he was like, if anybody can remember what the hell this is, like this picture. And I was like, my gosh, I remember this. Like, oh, did you record? Did you rewind the VHS? We got to take it back to Blockbuster. They charge a dollar, you know. Yeah, I know. Please be kind. Rewind. But anyway, like that. I kind of want that shirt. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Right. We're going to take a break uh, from all this nostalgia. When we come back, it's going to be more nostalgia in the year 1999. It is St. Valentine's Day Master right on the other side of this break. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. Now that we're back from commercial, before we dive into the event at hand, make sure you visit unhingedsn.com. You can hear us every single Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's when AEW Dynamite and NXT kick off. And of course, we're on all your podcasting platforms as well. But definitely go listen to us live on unhingedsn.com. You're ready to dive into St. Valentine's Day Master, man? I think. Not head first, though. <laughs> well, this was In Your House 27. And it was on February 14th, 1999, from The Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. Uh-huh, uh-huh. uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get it in. Uh, the attendance was a sold-out 19,028, and the pay-per-view buy rate was 1.21. So very respectable numbers here all the way around. Obviously, the anchor of this whole thing was the main event, Austin and McMahon in a cage. Uh, the pay-per-view sold out weeks in advance and broke all of Memphis pro wrestling records. Sorry, Jerry. Well, they knew Jerry would be there. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, here, here's a fun fact for you. That arena, the Pyramid, is now a Bass Pro Shop. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Keep uh, it white. <laughs> White, and it was on. Uh, they mentioned, or Jerry Lawler mentions it on the on the show. It's right on the banks of the Mississippi River, which will come into play later in the show. <laughs> yeah, it's like they don't even mention anything. They show it. <laughs> yeah, and it's called Mud Island, which again, keeping it white. But this was actually a fun fact for you. This was the final in your house event until NXT Takeover in your house in 2020. So I didn't even realize it when I book the show on our uh, schedule, but this is the final in your house of, of all time until, like I said, NXT. It's good crap, pal. Good Almost, stuff, pal. That's a 21-year layoff for, for in your house. Well, we start off with some old-timey looking video uh, with uh, like sepia tones and whatever that's uh, just clips of Austin and McMahon feud while My Sweet Valentine plays. I, I kind of dug it. I don't know, it was a little weird, but kind of dug it. It was, then yeah, we, it was fun. Yeah. But then it breaks into the actual theme for the show over more clips of Austin and McMahon. That Which, theme fun w- fact, it would be used for Doc Gallus. Yeah, yeah, Luke Gallus used it. Uh, and didn't the big show use it for like a little while? For like 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Uh, Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler are on, are on commentary for this show. Cole is filling in for JR while he's still out recovering from Bell's palsy. Apparently, JR was in the back producing him. If you yeah. watch Dark Side of the Ring, he's actually in the back at the Royal Rumble, too. Ah, okay. Not Dark yeah. Side of the Ring, sorry. Uh, beyond the mat. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, I guess he couldn't be on camera, and he was a little worn out. He didn't, he didn't want to do any on cameras, and he didn't have, you know, what it, he didn't have the gumption to 
you know, do the show live, but he was in the back producing Cole, which is why, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Michael Cole's commentary ever, but it was especially kind of bad here because he was honestly like, everything was so delayed, if you noticed, and you could tell like somebody was feeding him something because he'd start to talk and then he'd stop like he was listening. He's like, uh, uh, and then he'd continue on with what he was saying. It's like, yeah, so I, they weren't planning on this. So, I mean, good for them. It wasn't, the commentary didn't completely suck, but something else that the whole thing sucked. Whole thing sucked. Uh, something else that, you know, kind of fed into commentary not being good was Jerry, the King Lawler's voice was completely shot. He was hoarse as hell throughout the show. But and it gets it, even worse during the main event, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And then I but I was a little shocked that it's like, did you forget that your voice was hoarse or something? Because there were a few that he still did that ah! <laughs> at different times during the show. It's like, if my voice was killing me, there's no way I'd be screaming like a girl <laughs> during the show. Uh, but the, as soon as they show them, by the way, the crowd instantly starts chanting for Jerry. Like, nothing's even happened, and he's already the most over person on this entire show until the main event. You'd think he came out of a box or something. Yeah, I know. A kingly box. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, this first match here, we get a little build up. The, <sighs> Sorry. The Gold Dust Blue Meanie <laughs> feud is because Meanie has been calling himself Blue Dust and been playing head games with Gold Dust. Kind of like. They're similar to the, like what Gold Dust did when he was like fresh onto the WWE scene, where he'd be like flirting with other guys and obsessive and weird, whatever. It's not weird; uh, it's androgynous. Oh yeah. Uh, on a special Saturday Night Raw, Blue Dust, Blue Gold Dust, with blue paint. Sorry, I, I should probably <laughs> put that caveat in there. He blew him. With blue oh paint. yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah. So here you go. I'm sorry, I. I never seen the he, show, but I've seen I've seen he the meme. Blued him. Yeah, I I've like I said I've never seen the show, but I've seen the meme from uh, Arrested Development where the where uh, David Cross comes out like painted blue and he's like I blew myself. I'm afraid I just blew myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, but anyway, we get this first match: it's Gold Dust versus Blue Dust in three minutes and seven seconds. Two minutes too long. Uh, Gold Dust wins when Blue Dust misses the moonsault, and he hit the curtain call. About this match, Uncle Dave said, quote, The crowd died once the match started. The highlight, if that word could be used for this match, was Gold Dust lifting up Blue Dust's shorts and spanking his flabby butt. Comedy That's that the highlight? I guess so. He's hey, why float your boat, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, I was at a highlight. Uh, but he said, Comedy that wasn't funny and wrestling that wasn't wrestling. Even keeping this one short didn't save it from being an embarrassment. Negative one star from Uncle Dave. I just gave it a star. What say you? God, I wanted to give it zero, but one star. I mean, it sucked, but I mean, I thought it was a little funny. And seeing a guy like, you know, Blue Mini do a moonsault is always semi-impressive. So because he in no way looks impressive. So I will never use the word impressive and Blue Mini in the same sentence. So. You mean he didn't dig that blue top knot he had rocking? Come on, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> All right, anyway. Good God, move on. You know, we we used that for ECW the other week, where it's like, you know, your opener is supposed to bring them in to the to the match or into the card, whatever. But this one sends them screaming and running for the hills. But I want to forget this match happened right after it happened. <laughs> yes. Well. After the match, we we get something because Gold Dust riles up the crowd and he hits Shattered Dreams on Blue Dust, crushing his little Blue Dusts. <sighs> Could have said turning his things into Blue Dust, but oh, uh, there you go, Greg with the, Greg with the win. Right. Anyway, oh well, yeah, I win. That's what I'm yep. proud of. <laughs> well, this next match is Al Snow versus Bob Holly, not yet Hardcore Holly. Uh, it is for the WWF Hardcore title, the vacant Hardcore title. It's 10 minutes, 2 seconds long. Rogue Dog missed the show due to, quote, injury, rehab. They brawl all the way to the back parking lot, hitting each other with everything. It even gets out to the Mississippi Riverbank and then into the river in 
30 degree weather. No thanks. <laughs> no. Uh, I said, I wonder how much damage they caught, this cost them. <laughs> Cause I assume some of that stuff was like, you know, stuff to clean up the arenas that they were hitting each other with and they broke just a ton of stuff. But Bob, that's always, what your mind goes to. I mean, I'm sitting there like just like dollar signs are like racking up in my mind. I'm like, eh, Vince probably cut him a good check. But Bob Holly finally gets the win when he wraps Al Snow up in fencing that was along the riverbank so that Al Snow can't move and he pins him. Uncle Dave gave this one star. I gave it two and a half because I thought it was an interesting hardcore match. What say you? I said it was a very fun hardcore match. I thought I forgot how memorable it was. I said two. Yeah. I I mean, it was at the very least, uh, like at least average. I forgot how far around the arena they always went. That was fun to see. Yeah, this stuff was cool. I liked that. And occasionally when they would battle out into the the parking lots and stuff. I mean, we've seen them fight out into the snow and, you know, use wheelbarrows and everything else. So, I mean, that stuff was entertaining. Nobody bled. Nobody got seriously injured. And it was still a fun, hardcore match. So it can be done. So anyway. Moving on, we get footage of The Undertaker preaching to his Ministry of Darkness around a fire in what appears to be a parking garage. He basically tells Midian that he needs to beat the boss man tonight. And we go into this match, man. It is the big boss man versus Midian. It went just shy of six and a half minutes. (laughs) Uh, Midian, not yet naked, carries a jar to the ring. Okay, you stepped on my note, but... (laughs) Oh, excuse me. (laughs) Oh man, I, I, yeah, I took your thunder with that one. <laughs> Saying that he was clothed. But anyway, uh, Midian is carrying a jar with an eyeball inside, floating in formaldehyde. Uh, okay. We get an audible, sustained, boring chant during this match. Out of the blue, Big Boss Man hits the Boss Man slam on Midian for the win, to which Michael Cole says, what a maneuver! <laughs> Uncle Dave gave this negative one star. I gave it one and a half because it it definitely was below average. What say you? I gave it one star, and my my only note for it was this is clearly just a filler to get to hell in a cell. Yeah, this sucked, man. Like, uh, I don't know. But after the match, talking about the you know getting to hell in a cell, boss man grabs his nightstick. The ministry surrounds him. The lights drop, the gong sounds, and the Undertaker comes to the ring with Paul Bearer as the Ministry of Darkness beats the crap out of Boss Man. Viscera nails not one, not two, but three big splashes, and then they carry off the Boss Man to the backstage area. So, I don't remember here what happened to Boss Man after this. Do you? Not off the top of my head. Okay. If anybody can remind me, I try to forget about this. Feud I didn't think to about it. to even look because I didn't give a damn, but yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to hit hit us up on social media at main event underscore marks, because I, I tried to put this whole feud out of my freaking head <laughs> of the boss man being hung in hell in a cell. <sighs> but anyway, uh, moving on, we get a commercial for WrestleMania 15 before going to the back where Kevin Kelly is standing by with Mark Henry. D'Lo Brown, and the newly debuted Ivory. We have two Hall of Famers here, I just noticed. I didn't even think about it. Well, maybe you'll get there someday, D'Lo. Not as long as he's in Impact. Yeah. Ah, he's doing Hall of Fame work and <laughs> behind the table in Impact. Come on, now. <laughs> uh, maybe he'll go into their Hall of Fame. You think? You're done. They'll give him a watch from, from uh, the Disney parks. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, Henry is rubbing up all over Ivory because he's in full sexual chocolate mode here. The threat that D'Lo gives Deborah for getting involved isn't that Ivory is going to beat her up. No, no, no. It's that Ivory will disrobe her. I put WTF. <laughs> yeah. Kind of loses his luster, by the way, when like that's what she does herself all the time. I know, right? How, just like, how is that a threat? Like, hey, if you get in our way, we're gonna t- we're gonna strip you naked. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you're gonna save her the time of doing it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. 
But all right, uh, this next match is for the WWF World Tag Team Titles. It's Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart with Debra defending against Mark Henry and D'Lo Brown with Ivory. This match went about nine and a half minutes. Before the match, Mark Henry gives roses to Ivory because, you know, it's Valentine's Day, so got to plug that. During the match, King says that Owen, quote, isn't wrestling with shadows. I, I don't really know what that's supposed to mean, other than a dig at the documentary. Wow. That was um, blatant. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, what? I don't, I don't even know what that means, So, Like, it's not even like a clever line. Uh, but in the end, D'Lo goes up top and uh, is distracted by Debra, because apparently he's an idiot. <laughs> Ivory starts yelling with Debra, and D'Lo goes to split him up again, because he's an idiot. Inside, Mark Henry presses Jarrett up, and Owen blasts Henry's bad knee with Jarrett's guitar. And Jarrett locks in the figure four with Mark Henry, and or on Mark Henry, and he taps out. Uncle Dave gave this one star. I thought it was at least average. I gave it two and a half. What say you? I gave it two. I said it was pretty decent. I forgot like one thing that I did. I saw that I noticed when watching this. What? I said I forgot how any time Deborah was out there, everything focused on her. The matches always took a back seat. And like yeah. this clearly happened again. So. Well, like, and I know what I mentioned at the top of the show that I wasn't a big Jeff Jarrett fan, but at the same time, he was a good wrestler. Owen Hart was a great wrestler, and they're taking a backseat to the woman because puppies, I guess. Yes. Stupid. Whatever. Uh, yeah, it just, I didn't understand the thing. Like, the whole point of having Ivory out there is to take care of Deborah. So when Ivory starts to take care of Deborah, D'Lo's like, whoa, whoa, I gotta get involved. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what? And what's funny is Mark Henry was a little out of position, or somebody was a little out of position here, because when Mark picks up Jarrett for the press slam, like, he, Owen gets a guitar ready to smack him in the knee, and Mark, like, turns around to face hard cam, and Owen's, like, running around Mark to get into position, and then slam the guitar into his knee. I just thought it was a little funny. Uh, but post-match, Ivory attacks Deborah inside the ring and ripped her blazer in half. So, we still... Get her half naked? I I guess. I don't know. That's the high spot, Greg. High spot? Not a Steve Carino thing? Yeah. No, the Jack Victory thing. <laughs> right. Uh, Post match, Ivory and Deborah are. are I'm, never mind, I just read that. God dang it. <clears throat> Kevin Kelly's backstage with Mankind, showing footage of The Rock attacking Mankind on Sunday Night Heat, beating him up with various inanimate objects. Mankind tells Kevin Kelly that. He's mentally preparing himself to be a very ugly person tonight. Okay. If you can believe that, by the way, I love that he said that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I've got to mentally prepare myself to be ugly. Like, uh, okay. I thought you've been mentally preparing that for that your whole life, but oh, no, I'm Lord. just kidding. I'm good kidding. Lord. I love Mick Foley. I'm joking. <laughs> hey, like I just, said that though. If you can believe that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and even if, I, I said in all sincerity, oh, you know, Mick Foley is a, you know, a butt ugly man. Who cares? Have you seen his wife? Yeah, I think he's, yeah, he all kicked his coverage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll say that. Uh, but then we get clips of Val Venus repeatedly having sex with Ryan Shamrock, who is Ken Shamrock's kayfabe baby sister. Because of this, Shamrock keeps jumping Val Venus with chairs and his own fists. <laughs> so yes, this match happens. By this the whole way. match, this is a match for the Intercontinental Title that takes a the title takes a backseat to quit having sex with my sister. Like, yeah. what the hell? Yeah. But because no WWF referees apparently feel safe in this match because of Shamrock's attitude, we get Billy Gunn to officiate it in his shorty short shorts. Yeah, that was awesome. Got to see more of that man ass. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Ken Shamrock defends the Intercontinental title against Val Venus with Ryan Shamrock in his corner in just shy of 16 minutes. I guess Shamrock had the flu here, uh, supposedly. Before the match, Val lets all the ladies know that he has a heart on for them. <sighs> yeah. This was just... Uh, 
This was on, like, Joel Gertner level kind of stuff, but slightly less clever. Uh, these guys... Oh, beat... yeah, you just called Joel Gertner clever. Hey, some of his, his stuff always, well, not always, almost always made me laugh. <laughs> these guys beat the absolute snot out of each other and made me believe that they were actually mad at each other, so I did appreciate that. So many times you see these matches where it's like, I hate you, I hate you too, let's lock up. <laughs> okay? It's like a horrible movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Shamrock threatens Billy Gunn, Gunn tells him, hey, I've got the stripes, and they ain't red, or yellow either. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Oh, man. Like, he realized what he was saying. He's like, what? I mean, uh, not not red, yellow. <laughs> Shamrock had Venus pinned at one point, and Billy Gunn refused to count to three for some reason. Uh, Ryan Shamrock helps Val reach the ropes during the ankle lock. So Ken yells at her, and you can very audibly hear her t- er, hear him tell her to slap him. <laughs> she forgot. So she slaps Ken. Billy tries to step up and gets shoved, so he punches Ken, rolls him in the ring. And then Val rolls Ken up, and Billy makes a quick three count before flipping them both the bird and taking off. Uncle Dave gave this one and a fourth star. I gave it two and a half, because I did think it was an average match, at least. Let's say you. I gave it two stars, and I think you took way too much time to explain this whole stupid match. <laughs> I thought it was... I mean, I thought the premise of the feud was stupid, but I thought the match mm-hmm. itself was good. I love both of these guys. I think it would have been better the, if I thought the feud was. I thought the feud was good, because it made sense. It did. I mean, there was a whole, why, why is this happening? And it made sense. It was like, got to give credit for that. Yeah, I know. It gave Ken a reason to want to put his title on the line against Val. So, to that, you know, I think it's cool. Didn't, didn't this whole thing end with Val basically telling her, it's like, whoa, I don't want to be exclusive. (laughs) That's how everything with him ended, yeah. (laughs) Whoa, man. Uh, Anyway. After the match, Ken chases Billy and he brawls with him before just leaving. Billy then runs in the ring and beats up Val, repeatedly crotch chopping him, and then he leaves. Ryan has to help Val up and they leave together. And Val had a look on his face like, what the hell happened? I honestly forgot he won this match till I saw it back. Did he defend the, because I forget WrestleMania 15, did he defend the title at, at WrestleMania? Yeah, I believe Shamrock and Billy were in that match. Well, that makes sense. What was it, Road Dog? I think Road Dog reverted to the IC title. Yeah, oh, yeah, because him and yeah. Billy switched. Yeah. Like, randomly. It's like, ah, you know what? Road Dog, you go for the IC title. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Billy, you go to hardcore. It's like, why? But in the uh, build-up package to the next match, we see China split from DX and align with the corporation. She then tried to help Kane and his feud against DX. And the one thing they put over in this feud, or in this uh, build-up package, was that she just low blowed everybody all the time? Like yeah, if, <laughs> that's all if, she had. If somebody had testicles, they were getting low blowed by China. That's just how it went. Like, good lord! I thought that was her finisher after a while. But it's eight o'clock on Monday. Do you know where your testicles are? <laughs> uh, getting obliterated by China's arm. <laughs> but we now go to Triple H and X Pac taking on Kane and China. Swan went for 14 minutes, 45 seconds. Shane McMahon's on commentary for this one, which, without a doubt, was the worst thing about this match. He was... All he the- does is yell. Yeah, he screams and yells, Yeah, X-Punk! X-Punk! His name is X-Punk! Like, we get it. You call him X-Punk. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> was it WrestleMania 15 where he showed up with the DX jersey that said yeah. X-Punk on it? Yeah, yep. Okay. And they came out with a Jax figure of that, I believe. But anyway, uh, it's funny that we get our first taste of Corporate Kane in 1999, by the way. For like <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And for those that don't remember why he was in the corporation, it's because apparently they threatened, if you don't join us, we're throwing you in the insane asylum. Spoiler, yeah, right. it still happens. Yeah. Uh, Triple H and Kane battle out. They're outside to distract the referee. So Shane attacks X-Pac. Then X-Pac chases him to the back. Triple H tries to pedigree China, but Kane choke slams him, drags China on top of him, and they count the three. Uncle Dave and I both gave it two and a half stars for average. What say you? I gave it two. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. No. 
just the ending was stupid. <laughs> For China's first outing with the men, and I realized on the last podcast that she was in that triple threat, and we buried her, or I did, but just this was actually not bad. If she just worked tag matches where she only had to she had to share the time with somebody else, you know, I thought it would have been fine. She did a serviceable job. But yeah, I don't know. This uh this led to wasn't it didn't she turn on Kane at Mania, if I remember correctly? Yeah. And then and help help Triple H win or something. And he turned on X Pac and yeah. they both joined the corporation and Kane was out. It was a little mess of crap. Yeah, I was like All this in one night, by the way. Yeah, we had swerve, 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 swerve. You have to swerve that, that guy so we swerve. can swerve that guy. It was a swerve within a swerve. <laughs> It's almost like uh, like if Vince Russo was on Pimp My Ride, but with swerves. What the hell? Because <laughs> there was always that meme of Exhibit where he's like, I heard you like TV, so I put a TV in your TV so you can watch TV while you watch TV. But anyway, the, the video package shows the corporation turning on mankind for The Rock uh, at rock bottom in your house, which we have to review one of these days. We just have to. Uh, Mankind made The Rock pass out to the Socko Claw, but Vince McMahon said that The Rock would keep his title since he didn't physically submit. Later, on Raw's War, Mankind threatened to break Shane McMahon's shoulder unless Vince gave him a title match that night. Opportunity. Sure. This was the famous, like, you know, everybody switching over to the pre-recorded Raw, by the way, on the Finger Poke of Doom night. Uh, But... Yeah, anyway, he was awarded, uh, he was awarded the title match. He beat The Rock that night to, uh, with some help from DX and Stone Cold. Mankind then granted The Rock a title shot in an I Quit match at the Royal Rumble, got obliterated, and The Rock famously played Mankind shouting I Quit over the loudspeakers. Uh, they, who is it they repeated that spot with? It was The Miz and, was it Cena? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I always loved that spot, especially as a kid. And they it was, though, because Cena still won. <laughs> yeah. uh, they faced off again in an empty arena match at halftime heat, where Mankind beat The Rock with assistance from a forklift. That brings us to the rematch tonight. And on Sunday Night Heat, The Rock jumped Mankind from behind and beat him up while Mankind was training with Dominic DiNucci, Bob Backlund, and the Iron Sheik. And I love when The yeah, Rock... Yeah, those walked- three names were all said together. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic DiNucci was because that's Mankind's legitimate, like, he trained McFoley to be a wrestler, so that's why. Uh, Backlund, I don't know. And then Iron Sheik was was great. Like as the Rock is walking away, he's like, "What do you do that for, Rock?" <laughs> you chaperoni. <laughs> you got the chaperoni. I break your back and make you humble. But up next, we get the Rock defending the WWF World Heavyweight Title against Mankind. It is last man standing. This match just went shy of 22 minutes. I said, after what happened at the Royal Rumble, this match actually made me feel that Dwayne Johnson legitimately wanted to legally murder Mick Foley in front of everybody. <laughs> right. uh, the, the, piss on his family or something. I know. It, like, they, did he tell you that he liked Tony Atlas more than your dad? Like, what happened here? <laughs> but the Rockets on commentary mid-match, and later he gets on the mic to sing Smackdown Hotel for the Memphis crowd. But the referee gets bumped as Mankind makes The Rock pass out to the Mandible Claw. The referee's finally back up, but The Rock beat the count. Both men hit each other with chairs at the same time, knocking each other out. And both men fail to get up before the 10. So it is a draw. Uncle Dave gave this three and three four stars. I rated it a little lower at three stars. What say you? I gave it three, too. I said it was really brutal. Yeah. Uh, but just like one of the best last man standing matches ever. It was really damn good. I can't think of any other last man standing matches off the top of my head where there was a double knockout. So that was original. It was cool. Just the old Rocky two finish. Yeah. And the most brutal spot for me was, I can't remember. There was one, something involving the announce table that, made me cringe and then later Michael on Cole? yeah that uh but then he was laying Mick Foley or Mankind whatever was laying right outside the ring the rock picked up the steel steps and dropped them from inside the ring on top <laughs> yeah. of him I went oh my gosh like wh- you just damn near murdered him at the Royal Rumble with a chair 
And now this. What the hell happened? But the crowd rains down. Bullshit chance. As referees come to check on both men. EMTs wrap a brace around the rock's neck and stretch her out. Mankind at first refuses to be carted out, but he eventually gets wheeled out uh, into an ambulance as well. But seemingly concussed because he kept asking, I think, if he was picking himself up or something. He was asking, like, odd questions, and they were like, no, no. Yeah, so they they teased that at the beginning of the match because they showed both men had ambulances waiting for them in the parking lot. But that brings us to our main event here. I think we'll take our, our last break here before we get into the buildup, or sec, excuse me, second to last break. When we come back, we'll get into the steel cage match of Austin and McMahon. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right, we're back and it's main event time. We get a recap of McMahon of McMahon beating Austin in the Royal Rumble before surrendering his WrestleMania title match on Raw is War. I forgot some of the stuff, uh, you know, all these years later. But Commissioner Shawn Michaels then informs everyone that the title match will now revert to Stone Cold. But Stone Cold says that he'll put his title shot on the line against Vince McMahon in a steel cage at St. Valentine's Day Massacre. On an episode of Raw is War, McMahon makes Austin run the gauntlet against the corporation before finally pinning him after the boss man uses his nightstick on Austin. And then spitting in Austin's face, Austin says he's going to wipe Mc, uh, McMahon's spit off of his face with McMahon's blood. So that brings us mm-hmm. to this. Yeah. It's like, why would you wipe off spit with blood? That just seems like, I don't know, like, like you're getting worse at this point. But uh, we get to the main event here. It is Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Mr. McMahon in a steel cage. Actual bell to bell time. It went just shy of eight minutes. But. Everything before the bell rang, it went much longer than that. I will say, I don't know if you caught this. I'm sure you did. The line from Jerry Lawler I thought was pretty clever, where he said, if you write the word hate on every grain of sand in the Sahara Desert, that still doesn't equal all the hate that Mr. McMahon has for Steve Austin. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I thought that was, was kind of cool. Yeah, it was very clever. But we start this match out with McMahon not wanting to get in the cage. So Austin chases him around outside before fighting to get back in. At one point, Austin bounces McMahon's head off of the top of the cage, and McMahon flies back, landing with his back on the edge of the announce table before it collapses. That was sick, man. I cringed at that. Yeah. Bruce Pritchard said he, like, everybody in the back just sat silently, and he said, we thought he was dead. Because he hit, and he stopped moving. And we thought, he's, like, what are we going to do? He's He died. And he said, and the worst part was nobody was sending word back on if he was okay. So we had no damn idea until the end of the match. But, uh, yeah, EMTs try to take McMahon out of, out on a gurney. But when they're about to announce that Austin is the winner, Austin grabs Mike and says they never were in the ring at the same time. So the match wasn't even official. And as long as, as McMahon is still breathing, he's got some promises to keep. So Stone Cold wheels McMahon back to the ring and dumps him before beating him up throwing him back into the cage. Right when Austin's about to leave the cage, McMahon sl- uh, flips him off, and McMahon gets back in, beats him up more. Austin finally busts McMahon open, as promised. Right when, uh, when Austin's about to leave again, he then flips him the double bird, which makes it worse, Greg. And that yeah, it's Austin. like a double dog, man. It's like, you, know, you don't do that. And he's like, whoa. It's like, you f- one bird, whatever. Two birds, you're going to die. <laughs> Austin gets back in, and after he hits the stunner on McMahon, Paul White rips through the ring mat. Paul White is the big show, for those who don't know. Rips through the ring mat, and you can kind of see, did you catch in the corner, you see the knife going up through the mat and cutting it? Yeah, I saw it when it first happened, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, so you see that, and he rips through, and he comes into the ring, and he Bounces Austin off the cage walls. McMahon instructs White to chuck Austin into the cage wall. And uh, White does it. The wall busts open and flies open. And Austin drops to the floor. And he wins the match. 
McMahon screams in rage as Paul White uh, and Austin stare at each other down. The 53-year-old McMahon, by the way, had never worked a real match before, but he was out there for almost 20 minutes brawling with Austin and took one of the craziest bumps you'll ever see off the cage to the table and was far better than anyone could have expected, according to Uncle Dave, considering his age and that he had major neck surgery just five years ago. Uncle Dave thinks that the Vince bump was beyond insane. He gave it two and three, four stars. I mean, it, I loved it, but, you know, since we're grading on, you know, it, a match, I gave it one and a half to two stars. What say you? I said it was two stars a match, three stars as a brawl. Yeah. I wasn't sure how to rate it either, so. Yeah, it's a little weird. Because like I said, if somebody said, should I watch this? I would say, absolutely. And if somebody would ask, oh, is it is it a good match? I'd say, oh, no. God, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it sucked. <laughs> but you should definitely go out of your way to watch it. It was entertaining. Here's the thing that, and even Bruce Pritchard said he didn't agree with us and he pitched something else for it. After this, you would think they're going to build up for Austin and Big Show at Mania, probably. But I don't know. It. I they do feel, wrestle on Raw eventually. Yeah. I just feel like he might have been better served popping up the night after WrestleMania, maybe, and start there. But I don't know. That you know, that's looking back. And also, you I'm trying to figure out why it took him so long to come out and save Vince from getting the help out of him. (laughs) That's my thing too. It's like Austin almost won multiple times. How did he know that (laughs) Vince flipping him the bird was gonna stop him from winning, like and bring him back into the cage? Like, did he just bank on the fact that Austin was cocky and an idiot? Yep. (sighs) I don't know. And you and I pointed this out before that. His first night in the company, the big show fails. Yep. Huge error, too. Not just a fail, but like a huge error. Yeah. And then at WrestleMania, he fails again. <laughs> so, and blatantly, like he sets up these chairs and chokes Lamb's mankind through them to get disqualified on purpose. So, ugh, he looks like a complete moron to start off his WWF career. But, you know, he rebound at the Survivor Series by winning the title. It's fine. Yeah. He's a big, intimidating SOB, though, so I'll give him that. Uh, this was. He still had that hair, by the way. <laughs> Hell yeah, he did. He hadn't quite yet put it back in the uh, braided ponytail. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to dive into our final ratings. Just, uh, you know, tell what we overall thought of the event, and we'll get into what we think about, or we'll get into what we're going to review next week. Follow the main event marks at facebook.com forward slash main event marks pod on Twitter at main event underscore marks and on Instagram at main event underscore marks and at main event collector. The main event marks are available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. Now back to the show. All right. Ratings time. Final ratings here. Internet movie database gave the show 7.1 out of 10. Cagematch.net gave it 5.84 out of 10. I gave it a 6 out of 10. I really didn't think it was a very good show. What say you? I gave it a C minus. I said you can really feel that this was just a stop on the road to WrestleMania. Yeah. It I said I get that it's just pay per view, but the entire thing felt like that. Yeah. Like, it's this could have been a really good episode of Raw. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at all of these matches. I mean, maybe put Val and Ken on pay-per-view. Uh, the main event was de- the the last two matches were definitely pay-per-view caliber matches. But Mankind and Rock didn't close the Rumble either, did they? No, the Rumble no. closed it. Okay, that's what I thought. So this is three pay-per-views in a row where we get world title matches between Rock and Mankind that don't close the show. Yeah, but they did close Halftime Heat and Monday Night Raw. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm not, you know, crying about it. I, but it, like all three times, I know why they didn't. However, it's just funny to think about. Like, wow, you get three big matches between them for the world title. None of them were the main event. So, yeah, that was. Uh, they also that closed Survivor Series. I think no. Yeah, he beat Mankind in Survivor Series too. Oh wow! 
and I think they were in a cage match at uh, Judgment Day. So they literally were on every pay-per-view from October of 98 to February of 99. Good grief. Wow. That's a, that's a lot of wrestling between those two. <laughs> but anyway, next week, it is our last Super Brawl of the month, our second and final. We're uh, covering WCW Super Brawl 8 on February 17th. And you were physically at that one. It was at the Cow Palace. And so I'm going to be asking you if, you know, you have any uh, good standout memories from that show, like Quite reactions, all that good stuff. Yeah, I figured you would. Uh, I just recently watched it and got all my notes ready. And I'm excited to talk about this one for sure. And next week, we also have two bonus or two uh, podcasts coming out because we got the bonus on Friday. It is WWE No Way Out 2006. I don't really remember too much from this show as far as, like, watching it. I don't even know if I've seen it start to finish. So it'll be a nice look back. And we're going to wrap up the month, February 24th. We're doing some more TNA from 2005. We're doing TNA Against All Odds 2005, handpicked by Greg himself. So... If you don't like it, blame <laughs> blame him. If you don't like it, you don't like wrestling. This is a great show. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. a one match show, but it's amazing enough. Trust me. I like you know people always try to oh lol TNA and it's easy to do that you know there's stuff to point out but seriously 2005 and TNA had some great stuff and we haven't done a whole lot of TNA on the podcast so far so I'm very much looking forward to going back and watching this be some be some good stuff. But thank you for joining me today, Greg. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more time, uh, Main Event Marks is sponsored by Fubo TV and Fanatics. If you're a real sports fan, you want to click on the links down in the description. And don't forget to check us out on every single Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, right when Dynamite and NXT start on the East Coast on UnhingedSN.com. And of course, we drop new episodes of the podcast on the podcast feeds on the same day. I'll see you next week for Super Brawl 8.